This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. You don't have the title. Okay. And we are live. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today is a little bit different. I want to tell you a story. It's called On Being a Raccoon. It's the day when looking good made all the difference. You have the big C, Dr. Aquino said. Let me get my appointment book. He turned and walked out the room, leaving me utterly alone. My heart sank. The big C? Could he have not said more? Could he have touched my hand? The big C? Damn! I thought as I pulled from the tiny gurney two steps to the huge glass window, the only light in this tiny hospital room. The sun rose slowly from behind Diamond Head, turning the mountains from black to green, stretching its warm rays across the ocean. Honolulu in September 1982 was dressed for autumn. Located in Waikiki, adjacent to the Alawai Boat Harbor, Kaiser Permanente Hospital, patients woke up to the beautiful tropical sunrise and drifted off to dramatic sunset. Only today, I could see in the glass was me. My first thought was to cry. The big C ran through my mind. Was this really me? Am I standing here? I have to go to work. For more than 27 years, my husband and I had two beauty salons in the heart of Waikiki, one in the Reef Tower and one in the Edgewater Hotel. That was a time when snowbirds came to Waikiki for the season, the Canadians and the Europeans in the winter and the Aussies in the summer. Waikiki was magic. One could hear the rolling surf beckoning someone to join me. Along the shores of the gentle trade winds kissed the lacy bamboo fronds. Aroma of fresh cut plumeria from lace stands on every corner filled the air. A stroll in the evening afforded a bevy of entertainment at each hotel's showrooms. Flashing back the tears, racing my mind. Yes, I had to go to work. I cannot cry. No tears. I sucked in my gut, leaned into the window, and there before me was a carefully made up woman, completely with black mascara and big eyelashes. No tears, no. If I cry, the mascara will run. The eyelashes will loose, and I will look like a raccoon. With smudged black circles under my eyes, tears streaking down the blush and the brown paper bag color complexion peeping out from under the carefully applied suntan foundation. No, I cannot cry. After all, we sell looking good. Whatever color nail polish I wear, we sell a lot of. When I change my hair color, we sell. We sell. That's the beauty business. We sell. I cannot cry. Raccoons don't sell. Raccoons are not allowed. When Dr. Aquino returned to the tiny hospital room, I asked if we could wait until my husband returned from the mainland. He agreed it was a good idea. So he made the schedule for the big C surgery and began what was to be a long-term relationship. The years faded into each other. I don't remember how many or the number of cancers and surgeries I did not cry, no raccoons. It was clear I could not have afforded to have an affair. I looked like a loser in the hatchet fight. I did not cry. The years went by and snip, snip, chop, chop, cut, cut, did my breast. Four years later, the medical staff surmised that because I was young, I should have breast implants. Okay, why not? Will they make me look sexy? They pulled out the funny-looking gel things that were to be substitute for Mother Nature. 
I would even get to choose a size. Having never had sexy breasts, this was to be new adventure, another surgery. Days, weeks, and months went by with these things. I must admit, I looked great, and I did not like them. I could not sleep on those hard things, sticking straight up in the middle of my chest. Then one morning before dawn, I was in the shower, and I felt something strange under my make-believe breast. I woke Kenneth up and asked him what did he see. His eyes opened wide. He turned pale shade of gray. My body was expelling these implants. Since it was Labor Day weekend, neither my doctor nor any other surgeon was available. Even the hospital was gone. Everyone on the other emergency staff wanted to look, but no one wanted to touch. Finally, a male nurse fresh from Vietnam said he knew what to do. He wrapped me from head to toe in ace bandages, holding the implants in place until the doctor returned. Labor Day weekend, everyone is at the beach, and I'm wrapped like an antique mummy. It was more than Kenneth could stomach, and at no time did I see him cry, and I believe he did. Finally, the day came to remove the implants. After the surgery, I was in recovery room, dazed out of my mind. I tried to sit up only to see Elvis in the next bed, falling back deep into the pillow. I knew I had died and gone to Graceland. Enough, I asked the nurse if I could see my husband. She allowed as no one but medical staff could come into the recovery room. Feeling as if she was doing the right thing, she summons the doctor. He gently whispered my name and put out his hand. I felt his arm. Immediately I knew not Kenneth. The floodgates opened. I cried and I cried and I cried. The poor doctor was terrified. He did not know what he had done to me. How could I tell him? After years of not crying, not being a raccoon, I began to cry and cry and cry some more. The nurse gave me a box of tissue, slipped a drug into my mouth, and the tears stopped. Now, 30 plus years later, the cancer detection is much better. In the early days, I asked to have my husband sign, he had to sign a consent for me to have a breast biopsy. Can you imagine? What if I didn't have a husband, I asked. Dr. Aquino, was completely taken aback, having met Kenneth. If he had had a test secular biopsy, would I have had to sign for him? No. However, over the years, we've become great friends. A mammogram, the x-ray pictures on the breast, have gently improved, and no, the surgeries have not ended. My body just keeps producing tumors. I've learned how to detect the signs at the earliest stages, and no, there's not much point to crying. No raccoon, no. Raccoons are not allowed. For those of you that don't know, Kaiser Permanente is no longer on the beach at Waikiki. It's somewhere up in, way up, where is it? On the highway? And it's um, Dr. The, the Henry Kaiser, in 1958, built this high, uh, the, I no, think it was a small ho hotel, uh, a hospital in Waikiki, and he hired a group of doctors and brought them all in to take care of things. In 1986, the old hospital was blown up, and it was even shown on television on Magnum P.I., I think it was, as they blew up the hotel, I mean the hospital. And in its place now is this lovely Prince Hotel. So uh, the only reason I add this is that that Labor Day, the hospital was gone, the doctor was gone, everybody's gone, and I'm left with these things coming out of my mind. That's enough. That's enough <laughs> about me. But today, my guest is the lovely Beatrice. And those of you that are regular viewers, you know Beatrice hosts her show on Fridays at 4 o'clock. Beatrice, like me, 
is a cancer survivor. I don't know how many cancers. I lost count of my own cancers. So, so that's what we're going to talk about today with Beatrice, is about surviving this onslaught, the, the what do you call it, reoccurring cancers. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, and the, the space uh, to talk openly about cancer and uh, the many facets of cancer. <laughs> it's, there's good, bad, and ugly, and I hope that uh, we'll have a chance to converse about a little bit of each, each. Yeah, yes. as we go through it. So, yes, uh, I don't have a long journey with cancer as you uh, have uh, but you don't shared. have a long journey on this planet like I <laughs> yeah, do. So. I just <laughs> turned, I turned 45 years old in August uh, this year. And so um, this earlier this month, I was uh, diagnosed again with my fourth recurrence of cancer. So um, mine is a melanoma uh, that's been the primary uh, cancer. And so... You know, over the years and with the recurrences, uh, it is still melanoma, but now it's metastasized. And uh, so, so it's a new journey. Uh, and uh, here we are again. I was on remission for seven years. So just enough time to start having selective amnesia, you know, like you start just kind of putting things behind, you know, your brain, like that filing cabinet in the brain. You really don't freak out much, you know, when you do tests every year and uh, you start to breathe a little bit more easily. But, you know, I, I, it, it just, well, here we are again. It, <laughs> so. <yes>. <laughs> that, <laughs> that thing in your stomach that says, oh, sh yeah. do we have to do this again? Really? <laughs> you know, it's very interesting because uh, um, for me, uh, I think Every recurrence has been different. My first and second one, uh, I remember feeling more like what you described. Ah, I don't have time for this. I got work to do. I have a kid to raise. I got places to go. You just kind of, you know, dwell into like routine. And maybe for me, I think looking retrospect must have been uh, my way to cope with it, you know, because I think. As your awareness broadens and you start to dwell in a little bit deeper, uh, the raccoon comes yeah, out more and more. Bored, yeah. you know? And so I think in a way the brain and the heart have ways to protect us and to only allow us to experience what we may be able to take it. And so the first two times really, uh, the first time actually, my doctor was so confident that you know he got it all, and that uh, with the uh, you know, additional treatment, that you know I would not have to worry much, because we caught it at the very early stages of melanoma. But the thing is that uh, melanoma is quite an aggressive cancer, and also um, very hard to treat with conventional treatment such as chemo and radiation. So the second time, uh, I got a little bit more worried, but I, I was still in that state of like, all right, man, there's no, you know, problems, uh, you know, in metastasis in other parts of the body. So we're gonna just keep doing what we did the first time, but stronger. The third time, I was really angry. I think the anger had to come out fast, and that's when I really felt cheated in life. You know, I was 36, and it was quite. Uh, a different diagnosis and it was more severe and so uh, that's when you really go oh shit oh fuck oh, everything uh, you yes. know all together <laughs> so all of the delayed no, stuff that I didn't do the two times <laughs> you know I did it the third time uh, and uh, so it was a long it was a long journey because uh, it took me almost two years of treatment uh, and uh, I was very fortunate <coughs> to be able to partake uh, on a clinical trial in Los Angeles and that really was what uh, uh, gave me a second chance in life and so I am extremely grateful um, so now here we are again so there's no clinical trial treatments but the medications have changed and uh, um, you know things don't look so good and uh, you know like I, I keep very optimist look in terms of you never know and uh, you know I'll go with what I need to 
do in order to you know address you know this recurrence um, but yeah fourth time really makes you go <laughs> really <laughs> Now, it wasn't one time enough. The body is not designed to go through this assault. Yeah. One time even, but four times. And unfortunately, I mean, fortunately and unfortunately, uh, in, in the fortunate aspect of having recurrences, it means that we have science and medication that helps people beat the beast, uh, you know, even if for a certain period of time for a while, but then people are having more recurrences. So I guess we're dealing with a new breed of, you know, cancer survivors like yourself, myself. Here we go again, you know, so. Yeah. Why now? Yeah. I got so much to do. And uh, why not, you know? Uh, the thing, I think life has a couple of constants, uh, which is change, mm -hmm. uh, choices, right? And. Uh, and then you know you, you and you just have to go through with it, and uh, you don't have a, much of a choice on cancer, <laughs> you know. But you have choices on how you're going to handle it, and uh, the day by day is really what makes a difference. You know? Well, we're gonna take a break, and when we come back, um, I'm gonna talk with Beatrice about exactly that: the choices and how we handle this, and what to look forward to. Okay, we'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Sounds like scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Aloha, I'm Marcia, and we are here with the lovely Beatrice, who has a show on Think Tech at Friday at 4 o'clock. And we're talking about surviving cancer, the reoccurring cancers. So tell me, Beatrice, what, what do you think? How do you feel? What is surviving? What, do you, what are the steps to dealing with this? if there are such things? You know, I think it is such a customized and personable uh, answer because whatever works for one person may not work for another person. And so for me, and also each recurrence that I had that was in a different state in my life and with different coping skills too and different priorities. I think this time around, uh, um, what has been very helpful, because it's, it hasn't even been a month for me, you know, since I just learned about my recurrence. Uh, in my life, I've always um, scheduled my priorities. And now, you know, that is becoming even more so of a, of a, of a need. So reassessing priorities have been a big step. And uh, you know, to be quite honest, I think part of doing that life uh, review and, and really figuring out, am I really living an authentic life? You know, are things in alignment with my heart? And uh, you know, with regards to work, personal life, uh, you know, time that I spend doing certain things that I feel it's important, such as social justice, you know, <laughs> work and I, I know uh, activism, work and advocacy. And uh, uh, so that is a check, but I think that um, the good news for me is that the treatments that I'll be uh, going through are immunotherapy medication, so slightly different class of treatment than chemo and radiation uh, does to people. So 
So I, it's not as harsh? It, it is not as harsh because it does not work to destroy your entire body. I think with chemo and radiation, they just like nuke oh, the just, crap out of yeah, you. Yeah, it just burns and, up the good cells. And yeah. you hope that, you know, something good will emerge out of the dead, you know, stuff yeah. that, you know, the bad stuff that got killed. I mean, this one, uh, the immunotherapy works with your T cells and works with your immune system to target, to recognize and target the cancer cell and, and, and help destroy that, not the rest, not of, the your rest body. of your body. But there are side effects, and so, and there is also the part of taking time off. Uh, and uh, so, like, for me, I think that the part of really where I am at in my life, I already raised my family. And uh, you know I've been divorced for a while, so so it's like well I don't have certain pressing issues that I used to have before. Uh, so I think it becomes more about where do I find that balance between surviving, you know, because you do have to have a sustaining way of you know make a living, Live. but also living life. So enjoying. The Enjoying the here yeah. now, the mundane things. So yes. I'm, like, in a way, I feel like, oh my gosh, I live in the most beautiful place on earth, you know, which is Hawaii, and, uh, you know, the nature here is so powerful and so majestic that it really helps a lot of people uh, come to terms to like where we at in relation to the universe. Like we're a grain of sand, right? And so. I want to enjoy more of nature. I want to do things that I always keep postponing because we always have this illusion that we will live a very long time and that we will get to do things that we really want to do when we retire, when we are older. And the truth of the matter is that, well, some of us have that luck. You don't have to have a cancer diagnos diagnosis to think about that. But the, the truth is that all we have is now. So in many ways, uh, a new recurrence have helped me reassess how am I living life now. And so that's been a gift because uh, I'm finding my deficits. I am focusing way more you know, at work and things that are important, but at the expense of not taking that time to do the things that I really want to do. And, uh, and I, I want to do the work, I want to do the activities that I do because it's a big part of my identity, but there's also another part that needs to be you know, paid attention to. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing. And I think like I, it's very interesting, what, what do you do? Um, and I got all kinds of advices over the years, you know, don't cry, cry, uh, diet stuff, you know. Now I kind of follow my compass, my inner compass. Yes. I have days that I sit down in front of the ocean and I'll cry silently for hours. And I have days that I don't even think about it. Uh, sometimes it's something that will trigger, you know, a moment, that tenderness, you know, that spot in the heart, you know, and so I'll tend to that. Um, but, you know, life does not stop because you have cancer. <laughs> right. and, I uh, found that. <laughs> isn't that something, you know, on that? So and nobody cares. And that, and that those people, people say, oh, that's, oh, I wish you, and they send pretty cards yeah. and whatnot. But their lives are busy too. The thing is that those who care about you and who are close to you will care, but it's a very personal journey. It is. Uh, you know, and and, uh, and you know, it can be all about the cancer and the journey and the treatment, or it can be also about that. That's one part of your life, but also all of the other aspects of living. And so for me, I think handling cancer has been about living, you know, and really, really savoring, you know, every opportunity every, that yeah. I have. I the feel rawness every, yes. of it. Yeah, I feel the, up every day. Yeah. Every minute of every day is full. Yeah. There, there are no moments when, oh, I guess, oh. no, no, no. Every moment of every day, I wake up ready to go. Let's get it on. Because you do learn when you look at that, the big C, as, as he called it, when you look, come face to face with this, this is mortality. Oh, there's an end to this, you know? And when you look, 
look at it right dead in the eye and say, oh, I'm mortal. There's a fine yeah. finality to this. Yeah. Yeah. Then you have to get in every minute of every day yeah. to get to do, to live, to enjoy the time you have on and this planet. And that has been like your way of coping with it, mm -hmm. which is you feel like I have so much I want to accomplish and to do and have places to go. I've done a lot of that in my journey, but I also, and now I really appreciate that time where I can't undo things. I have a, the unto-do list. Oh, I've got, to, I've got to do that. I've got to do that. I've got to do it. I am and, uh, going to make an undo <laughs> list. It's amazing. So the power of delegation, the power of letting go, the power of really thinking about scheduling your priorities. Because, uh, you know, for every hour, second that we spend doing something, that means that that is part of your life that you're also committing to it. Yes. So uh, I have a horrible time saying no to people or to, to, to you know, assignments. And uh, so this has been a wonderful practice to be able to say no with a smile, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and it's important because then I can also say yes to the other things that have always been put in the back burner, which is part of living for me, my journey. You know, and, uh, and uh, you know, not too many years ago, we had this movement of Live Strong through Lance Armstrong. Right. And I wear the, you know, the yellow, the yellow. bracelets and, yeah, Live Strong and all of that. And uh, I think the true healing for me has really started to occur because there is the healing in, mul in multiple levels. This is the one of the illness itself but your entire life, your spirit, your heart, your relationships, everything is shifted. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are gains, but there are also big losses you know, in that process. And so I think to be able to come to terms with all that had happened, you know, it has taken me years, it continues, it's an ongoing process, you know, and that so I'm starting to grieve uh, and uh, to reflect on losses and, and relationships that will serve uh, the pain that other people have felt, you know, that loved me and that, you know, I wasn't able to really support them because I was not in the position to do it. Now, years later, I am now in a position where I can start thinking more about how to support those who are close to my life, where I think it, it, it's a journey that only occurs as you start going through it. As you go through it, you yes. Know, so like, it, it, and even though it's not my job but to do that, and it's very hard to be able to tell people the truth and not sugarcoat it, and to see their tears, because those are tears of love and worry. And, uh, and I feel I have a responsibility to support them also. Uh, so, but that's part of my journey now. Yeah. That was no part of my journey or my other three recurrences. You know, I didn't allow for people to be much of a part of that. I pushed people away. Oh, I did that too. I ignored the cancer as much as I could. You know, I, you know, my family suffered a lot, especially my daughter. You know, the first two times I really minimized the cancer so she didn't have to worry about so much because I was functional. The third time she saw this hurricane <laughs> awakening and she's a teenager, just like, what happened to my mother, you know, and plus the hormones and everything else. And so, you know, it, it's really a process. It's a process to tell people that are around you that's like, it's going to be okay no matter what happens. I don't have a... Uh, I don't have an agenda. I want to, you know, get better, but my goal is to be above room temperature every morning for as long as I can and to live, you know, as happily as I can. Well, as always, it's a pleasure spending this time with you. And uh, come back and watch Beatrice today at four, no, Friday. Friday, yes. Friday at four o'clock. And I love being with you. I love spending this time. And this is dedicated, this show is dedicated to anybody everybody
that's living with cancer. So again, thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.